Yes, you can. Yes, you can start in a call center and work your way up the corporate ladder to become a top 1% originator in your profession. That is today's special guest, and that is this top producer interview. Her name is Lauren Walton. She is my new friend. She is my new colleague because she represents the lower brand and she is today's very special guest. Lauren, welcome to the Loan Officer Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm super stoked that we finally get to do this. Truth be told, I tried to get Lauren to hop on and do a TLOP exclusive last month, but your crazy travel schedule got in the way. I was down in Florida. Yeah, you were down my way, but you just stopped by to say hi. What's up I with know, that? We were in the panhandle. Oh yeah, that's not really Florida, by the way. Yeah. We <laughs> call that Lower Alabama. <laughs> Yep, it's a gorgeous, why. gorgeous area. <laughs> Destin 30A, Panama yes. City, Pensacola. Shout out to Subatello and that whole entire crew. Heather, Dawn, JJ, et cetera, in Fort Walton Beach. I had a branch in Fort Walton Beach really? for like 12 years. Wow. Um, yep, uh, they now still represent the Waterstone brand. I now okay. represent the lower brand, but they're still friends and family. Nice. Um, yeah. So We uh, actually got a unique experience this time because it was Helene when we were there. You were there for Helene? And Halloween? we evacuated from Inlet to Pensacola. We were going to go to Mobile, but we're trying to go back. So we're like, we don't want to go too far. So we went to Pensacola for like a day and a half. So we got to drive along the coast. It was actually really pretty. Did you not contemplate just going back to Ohio? We did. So we had and two. And you remembered it was Ohio. <laughs> Two of our larger group and their two kids did fly home. Okay. But we were like, you know, on Wednesday, Thursday, and we had our house till Sunday. So, like, if we could just get out of here for like a day, day and a half, make sure we're safe, we still have some days to come back and enjoy it. Albeit it was double red flags the rest of our trip, but we still did get to come back. Well, I mean, usually the weather is really nice after a hurricane. It was nice. It was sunny. It was yeah. beautiful, but the water was too rough. Too rough. Yeah. For That's days. all right. You still yeah. got to lay out and enjoy the beach. And, and I stare never saw at Pensacola, that. which was. Oh, nice. you've never been? I've never been. Oh, there you go. So we drove up the coast to Pensacola just to get a little out of it. And we kind of evaluated once we got there, do we think we're far enough? Even there, it was like 12 foot waves and 25 mile per hour winds. Like, we're like, are we far enough? <laughs> but yeah, so. Yeah, so um, people who don't uh, know the geography of Florida or even the Southeast, to get from Orlando, where I live, to Panama City, Pensacola, Fort Walton Beach, yeah. like a seven hour drive. Yeah, it's far. Yep. So I always joke when my friends and my best friends live in Atlanta, they're like, oh yeah, we go to Florida all the time. I'm like, no, you go to 30A. Yeah. yeah. Like you want to go to Florida, go to like Orlando, go to Tampa, go to St. Pete. Yep. Go to West Palm Beach. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. You know, yep. Fort Lauderdale. Don't go to Miami because that's Miami. Yep. Like that is Miami. <laughs> yes. It's its own, it's its, own, it's its own thing. Everything. And Miami is pretty awesome. But I wouldn't call Miami like the representation of Florida. Correct. I, I carve that. that out and we just call that Miami. It's its own thing. So let's jump into your story because you have a story that honestly I have not been able to feature yet. Like, you know, I know of you and now we're becoming friends and we're going to be colleagues now for the next decade plus. And um, I have uh, a buddy of mine that we work together. His name is Brad and he's in, in Dallas. And the two of you are probably the two that stand out the most as top producers in the mortgage space retail originators, meaning you're self-sourced, yep. right? It's your book of business. It's your name and your likeness. Yes. That's generating these leads. You're 90% purchase focused, Yes. right? You're producing at a, at a level that Scotsman guide said you're a top one percenter, but you didn't start this way. You started in a call center. Correct. And I am a huge proponent for anyone who tunes in and they're like, well, Dio, what's the best place to get started? I'm like, the best place to get started is where you can find a great mentor mm -hmm. and get training. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a broker, a bank, a credit union, a call center, mm -hmm. or working for an IMB like lower. Yep. It's a matter of where can you go to get the support that, that you need. Yes. Um, and I think too many people think, oh, well, I'm just a call center originator. Oh, I, I got started in a call center. I can't become what is maybe paraded or highlighted in our industry. And you're here to say, no, no, you yep. can. Yes. So walk me through that. So you graduate from the Ohio State University. The. Um, your degree is in? Marketing. In marketing. And you entered the job uh, force, the workforce, 
not in a great time, right? 2009? 2009. So coming off the, the Great Recession. Yep. And was your first job out of college as a mortgage loan originator or did you work in marketing somewhere else? So it was. It was at Wells Fargo Financial, which is no longer in existence. Um, I worked in, it was a retail type environment. Um, clients came to us or we actually at the time would go to clients' homes. Okay. We would sign docs in clients' driveways. Um, it was a lot of subprime. It was a lot of FHA. It was a lot of consolidating their credit cards with their mortgage or we were doing auto loans where we consolidate their credit cards it was very interesting it was a very you know different dynamic than what we're what we're seeing now a lot of you know just kind of still with that stated income stated asset world that we were 327 we were in yes okay. exactly so that um was not really what i was looking for for like a long-term career um so i did go to cardinal health shortly thereafter and was in marketing for about two years there um in school you know they teach you a kind of about the fun, fancy marketing, which is marketing to consumers. Whereas there in healthcare for that particular organization, it's business to business marketing. Okay. So not, again, not really something that I saw longevity with. Um, it felt a little bit like a dead end. So that's when I um, decided that I would try mortgage again. So had a bad taste from my, my days at Wells Fargo, but Chase has a huge presence here in Columbus, Ohio with Consumer Direct. Um, and so my fiance at the time was working there. So that's how that yeah, I love Transition that. I love happened. that story. You like how I spun it too. I'm yeah. like, yeah, because her husband made her yes. do it. Yeah, your fiance at the time <laughs> so was you like, give it honey, a try. You're, you're not digging this job, yes. corporate yes. marketing. Yep. You should come check out where I work and maybe do what I do. Yep. And like anything, he helps you get an interview. And he re reassured me it was different than Wells because he was at Wells too. He okay. left Wells after about three months. Is I was there for met? about a year. We met at Wells. Okay. Yep. And so he's like, Chase is different. You know, Chase is different. He was getting the training, just like you mentioned. He was getting good mentorship. He was there was a great leadership there. I mean, Chase, like I said, is like in Columbus, like they are a mecca for mortgage. And so it was where a lot of people in our market got their start. But it was a really good opportunity and hard to get into. Yeah, so you worked there for how long? 10 years. And in those 10 years, if you were to guess, how many transactions do you think you funded? Thousands, thousands. I mean thousands. Yeah, so you had plenty of at-bats. You Correct. got really good at talking to borrowers. Yes. At learning loan programs, products, and guidelines, pushing files through the system. Yes. Um, but what you didn't have was your own book of business. You're exactly correct. Meaning if you resigned, your income the next month, your referrals the next month, your leads the next month were zero. Correct. What, so let's let's dive into that. What was the turning point? What what was transpiring in your life that you decided now is the time that you want to go bet on yourself, that you want to make it about Lauren Walton and the Lauren Walton brand? Yep. Where like where did you have that that confidence or what where was a pivotal moment that, you know, prompted you to make that change? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, the years at the bank at Chase, I learned so much and I will always give kudos and give credit there because they hold you to a very high standard. All of your calls are recorded. All of your calls are monitored. There are disclosures after disclosures you have to read on every call. There is like little to no room for error, especially in the relocation space, which is specifically where I was, because it's not only one customer. There is a relo company tied to that. And there is also a employer then tied to that. Right. So very very little room for error. Um, we're, you know, graded on our customer satisfaction surveys and everything we do is over the phone. So, you know, the, the a level that you have to, you know, be at to build rapport over the phone with customers and realtors from across the entire country, like it's, it's difficult, right? They don't know you from Adam. So that takes a lot of time and patience and skill. But the other thing at the bank that I really was able to really just grasp and, and become so good at were guidelines due to the trainings that they, you know, would give us. Okay. Um, but mentorship, the hands-on training, I felt like I was be, being able to become an expert in my in my craft of mortgage, right? But then I got to the point where there was, I felt little to no room left to grow. I had sort of mastered everything I could in that seat. And I think COVID had a lot to do with it because post-COVID, we were all home. So the networking I was able to do in that seat, I am a people person at heart. I love networking. I love relationships. I love people. I was at least able to do that in the majority of my years at Chase with my peers. So I was able to network with them in person and, you know, grab coffee and have meetings and leverage, you know, other people that were doing better than me and management. And then COVID, that all stopped. 
So you're still working in that consumer direct environment during COVID. Correct. When, when did you make the transition to what I would call traditional retail? It wasn't until late 2021. Late 2021. Yes. So that's going to make this story for me that much more enticing and interesting because you basically have built your book of business during what I would deem one of the softest mm-hmm. markets, mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest downturns from yes. like a peak to a valley. Yes. Yes. And you're not just surviving, but you're thriving. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're gonna dive into that. Let me circle back for a second though. Loan officers, if you're anything like me, you've probably never even thought to partner with Open Door. Well, I'm here to tell you, rethink that thought process. Here's why. How many times have you had a buyer or a borrower wanting to purchase that next home, but they couldn't get an offer accepted because they had to sell their home first and no sellers were willing to accept an offer with a contingency. Open Door has a solution and they're willing to work with your realtor partners. And Open Door is perfect for buyers wanting simplicity and convenience. As long as the home is not already listed in the MLS, they will pay your referring agent a 1% commission when they buy your borrower's home. Open Door has been around for over 10 years and they operate in 50 different markets. So do yourself a favor, do your referral sources a favor and look to Open Door the next time you have a borrower who needs to get a home sold quickly and conveniently and can't mess with the stress of listing the home for sale in the MLS. Curious just about that nature of obviously you got to practice a lot of what we preach on this show, which is you made your entrance into the industry about working for a company that was going to support you, train you, um, offer you that culture yes. and even the mentorship that I think we all need. Cause yeah. I believe, and I, I do a lot of coaching outside the mortgage industry for, um, juniors and seniors that are in college Love out that. at UCF's college of business. Yeah. And the advice I typically give to a 22 or 23 year old is many times in life I've learned you are going to take the job that pays the most, but not necessarily comes with the best training or support, Mm -hmm. or you're going to take the job that has the best training and support, but it might not pay the most. Rarely are you going to find that opportunity that does both. Correct. So on that note, I know that you can make a substantial living at Consumer Direct. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious, and this is a two-part question, what's the most money that someone that was crushing it like your peers, like you don't have to name names, but when you go back and even if you take out the 2020 and 2021 numbers, you look at years like 2017, 2018, 2019, Mm -hmm. when it comes to W2 earnings, what were those men and women making that were in the top 10% of production in the, in your consumer direct world? I would say probably like two to 250. Holy cow. So making great money. Making what great was money. the average consumer direct person making? I'd probably say one to 150. Okay. So if you were going to stay employed, mm-hmm. meaning they didn't fire you for low production, mm-hmm. then you were going to make low six figures. Correct. And if you were one of the top producers, you were going to make two to 250. Yep. Okay. So every reason for many people to never leave. To never leave. To never leave. Yeah. You chose to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you answered this yet. What was the deciding moment what yeah. forced your hand what what was it that you're like i'm gonna go do this so i realized like i said post covid it was all home so the the networking that i had been enjoying at least with my peers at the very minimum because mind you i was everything else was over the phone mm-hmm. was now gone so working from home you know i look at my husband and i say i, I can't do this forever like i'm not around people he was like you mean we're getting I'm divorced not, yeah you can't do this forever <laughs> Who's taking like, the kids? I'm not networking. <laughs> I'm not around people. Like that component was just lacking so much. So for me, like the consumer direct model, it's not that it's, I think the, the myth is that it's all transactional, right? And the retail world is, is relationship based. There is still such a huge relationship component to consumer direct, but it's not in person. So like those relationships don't have a lot of depth to them. You have a relationship with an agent and a client for about 30 days, right? During that transaction. Mm -hmm. And then you may get that client to come back. You may get some referrals, but like there's no ongoing relationship building because it's impossible, right? You're doing loans with people across the entire country. You never get to meet them in person. So how much depth can there be? How can you possibly continue to pour into those? So the biggest thing for me was realizing that my business wasn't as relationship focused as I wanted it to be, nor was I honing in on one particular market. And 
like you just said, there was nothing was mine. Everything I was doing was for was for the bank. And then I also started realizing that there was lack in innovation and technology. And then one of the biggest ones was products. Like I felt like I would turn business away all the time. And I realized as a, a large banking institution, the the whole premise of the company is not on mortgage, right? There are so many other components and factors that they're focusing on, depository relationships being a huge one, mm-hmm. that I couldn't possibly get like the resources and attention that I needed to make the mortgage product and process as good as it could be. So I knew that when I left, I wanted to go somewhere that the entire company's mission and vision was to make mortgage as, as be- the best it could be. And that's all the focus was for everyone that worked at that organization. So that transition to lower, that was, it was the wanting the relationships and wanting to hone in on a market, but it was also wanting to be somewhere where the entire focus of that organization was on what I, what I needed for myself and my clients was just to focus on more. So the drive was truly about the people first, Correct. like you were missing your people and work from home due to COVID stripped you of something that, that filled your bucket, yes. something that made your heart smile. Correct. Um, cause I would have thought it would have been. I'm tired of working for the man. Yeah. It's my turn to be the woman. And meaning I want to take control of my destiny. I want to own these, these database of clients, these database of referral sources. And I want to know that regardless of where I work, these people are going to work with Lauren because I am a badass at doing mortgages and helping people purchase real estate. Yep. And that's part of it. That was okay. part of like what I envisioned for the relationship component. But to be honest, like I didn't know what I didn't know. And okay. like I would tell my husband straight up, like if I can make as much money, but I'm happier, then that's great. Obviously I didn't know what the trajectory would look like and what the income potential would be. But I knew that if I could make the same amount of money, but have more flexibility. And that was the other component of, of consumer direct being like chained to a desk yeah. more or less that wasn't working for me and and what I was looking for, not as much flexibility. Well, and I was wondering too, like getting to know you off camera, um, you know, you have a new family, right? Mm-hmm. You have, I say you have small kids. You have small kids because mine are like almost 17, almost yeah. 20 <laughs> years are still like pre-K and yeah. kindergarten yeah. Yes. age to where, you know, being a retail originator or a mortgage broker, there tends to have flexibility in schedule. Now, I will tell you, if you're trying to be successful, you're still going to work 40 to 60 hours a week. Yes. But whether you show up at 7 a.m. or 9 a.m., whether you leave at 4 p.m. or leave at 7 p.m. Yes. is irrelevant because you have more autonomy than when you worked in that consumer yes. direct world. So I was curious if any of that also played into it. Yes. Having some flexibility was was very important to me. But I because didn't you left know your husband behind. What that looked like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so him and I have very different skill sets and we st- we still talk about that to this day. Like not that he was throwing me to the wolves, right? But like one of us wanted to see what what it would be like, right? And we felt like my skill set was more aligned with what would would work in retail. Yeah, I don't know if we introduce that <laughs> that part that chapter to this story, yes. but uh, Lauren and her husband worked together. Together. Yeah. Yes. At the same national bank. Correct. Um, he's still there. He's still there. Still crushes it. He still crushes yep. it there. Um, but one of you wanted to dip your toes in yes. that in that water. Yes. And uh you drew the long straw. Yes. Not the short yes, straw. Yes, exactly. I am the more like social butterfly okay. and people person and you know, we thought that that was gonna be a good alignment for my skill set. So obviously, and shameless plug here, y'all, so get ready. <laughs> Obviously, you picked a great company. Yes. But more importantly, because I I believe there's a dozen good mortgage companies out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I coach it and I preach it and I speak it that the company is almost the standard you need to have that. But the local leadership mm-hmm. is what matters most. Yes. And you found in Nick Gallagher, you found in Eric Gerber, two great leaders. Yes that you could go work for. And it just so happened they were aligned with lower. Yep. Um, and I think that's like the the ultimate, like double whammy complete package. Yes. So you, you found that, but what I really wanna spend the rest of the episode getting into is what did you do? Yep. How many of your secrets are you willing to give away to that next guy or girl who is getting their start in the mortgage industry. They're working in a call center, whether it's here at Lower, whether it's for New American Funding, whether it's back at Chase, or you name one yeah. of the the great opportunities. Veterans United is one of them, where people can have a great career yep. helping folks structure debt to purchase real estate. Yes. They just do it differently. 
Uh, what did you do coming out of the gates? What what did your game plan look like? Did you hire a coach? Like walk me through and walk the audience through yeah. what you did to become this forty million dollar producer. And that's that's a great point about it, it was for me it was the people. I think I told you this before we started. I never even updated my resume, and I knew I wasn't looking at companies where I didn't know who I'd be working with and for. And I, to me, I cared way more about the people than I did about any paycheck, any sign-on bonus, any guarantee, anything like that. Because I, I had had some so-so managers in the past at other places, right? And so I knew that the people mattered to me more than anything. And in our world, I there's people that I know I can't be trusted, right? And so I knew I wanted to go to a place where I could trust who was on the other side. And that is Nick and Eric. And so that was an easy decision for me, for my family, with my husband and I. Um, but um, with that being said, you know, Eric played a really intricate role in my early success and what has, you know, continued. He was really the one that bridged the gap for me. So I think making sure that you have the right direct manager who's going to give you the hands-on training that you need. Like I'm talking going to meetings with me, letting me sit in on his, like actually hearing what he's saying to realtors in our market, who he's prospecting, how he's prospecting them, going with me to mine and then, you know, critiquing me afterwards. Like that was, that was the first six, eight, nine months of, of me really being in this role. Yeah. Cause you didn't need program product guideline nope. training. You nope. knew LTV, DTI, yep. how to run AUS, the difference between Fannie and Freddie. Yes. Like you're, you're calculating yep. your, your UFMIP, your MI, like you were yes. all in as a technician. Correct. Thousand of loans underneath your belt. Correct. But you had never truly sold, uh, as a retail loan originator by selling, I mean, sold yourself. Correct. That's exactly um, correct. And did, did you, so, so obviously Eric was instrumental and for all the branch managers that are plugged in and tuning in, are you doing that for your LOs? Yes. You know, like let's, let's start there. But how did you find those realtors or those builders or those financial advisors? I mean, what did your day look like those first six months coming out of the gates? Yeah. And one other thing I wanted to mention before yes. we jump into that is that the other thing was the products, right? When I worked at the bank, I had very vanilla product offerings. So I didn't know anything about physician loans. I didn't know anything about construction loans. I didn't know anything about non-QM. There was just, so that was like a whole nother world that I had to, to learn. Or so, that you can actually do a VA loan over a 60 or even a 50 yeah, yes. DTI as long as it, you have residual income. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. Eric played a huge role in that. And then still to this day, my LOA she is a godsend and she also plays a huge role in that. Like there's still things I run into that I'm like, you can do that. Yeah. And she, she figures it out for me. So having the right people there to, to guide yeah. you because there's a whole nother world of products. Um, but to answer your question about those early days, it was really sitting down. We did so many like whiteboard sessions or so many like brainstorm sessions where we talked about who we were going to prospect for me. I knew that I wanted to go after people that were like-minded. I wanted to go after, I was in growth mode, right? Yep. I'm starting out, I'm in growth mode, grind mode. I need to go after, in my mind, agents that were also in growth and grind mode. So that tended to be people that were around my age. It worked really well for me to go after some working moms. We have other things in common, right? Yeah. There's more depth to the relationship. There's more layers when we can talk about our kids and working rather than just you're a realtor and I'm a loan officer and we can you know, swap business. There was a lot more depth to those relationships. And so that was really where I started. Who do I know? Every person I know owns a, that owns a house knows a realtor, right? Every person I know. So start there. Did you like your realtor? Did you have a good experience? Would you mind introducing me? And it's like, when I first started, I'm like, I don't know any realtors, but you know, people that know realtors, yeah. right? So just figuring out who I know, I use social media as a tool to figure out who do I know that they know that can make an introduction for me. Are you a Facebook person, Instagram person, TikTok person, what's your preference? Instagram's probably my favorite, okay. but I do use Facebook. I do also use LinkedIn. Okay. I do not use TikTok. I know I probably should, but yeah. to date I don't. That's right. Yeah, but Instagram, I'm huge, huge on Instagram. Um, and in our market, it seems like a lot of agents are as well, so. How many phone calls to your circle of influence do you think you made or text messages? I mean, how many opportunities to reach out because you were trying to find what we call that triangle of trust? Yes. You know, it's like, why cold call someone when you can warm call them? Yep. And I can warm call them. And I, I coach this in our, in our coaching platform where especially when someone's trying to either launch their business or they're trying yep. to like double up what they've currently been doing. It's like, okay, well, how many of your people, people you invite to your wedding, people you yep. send holiday cards to, how many of them know what you do for a living? And yes. by what, know what you do for a living, not, 
oh, you do loans. No, I bring value to real estate agents. Therefore, yes. what realtors do you know? Yes. If you were to guess going back two and a half years ago, how many of those outbound solicitations did you make to your circle of influence? So I would say hundreds to my circle of influence, but very few were cold calls. And that was the one thing that I was really trying to focus on that I don't like getting a cold call. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to make cold calls. So I wanted warm introductions as much as I could. So I've, again, figured out who do I know that knows this realtor and who can make an introduction to me. And so the calls and the text messages were to my circle of influence that I could say, hey, do you mind making an introduction to the realtor that you use? And did you reach out to like over a hundred of them? Yes. Like, did you go through, what's your husband's name? Chance. If Chance and I were to get remarried today and have a Mac Daddy wedding with like a DJ and a live band and an open bar. Yep. And unlimited budget, who would I invite? Yep. Yep. Because I would guess those are the people you, you want to reach out to, out to first. Yep. To, and not, not because you want them to do a refi with you. Yeah. But because you want them to refer you to either a realtor or a builder. A hundred percent. And yeah. you did over a hundred of those. At least. At least. And like ongoing. And I feel like I, you know, there's that book about never eat lunch alone. Mm -hmm. And I really just tried to like pack my schedule and just constantly have new meeting after new meeting. And I'm still doing that. Like, I just feel like in order for me to continue, I don't want to take my foot off the gas. Like I would say I'm still in growth mode. Yeah. Like it really never stops. And so, and now I'm at the point where there's agents I work with that I'm like, who can you refer me to, right? They're around other peers that are realtors. And you're asking for it. And I'm asking for okay. it. And I also have started to expand into other industries, title companies, insurance agents, financial advisors, attorneys. You know, there's a lot of other opportunities that you can get referral business from. But again, like tapping into my own financial advisor and then who is he networked with and who does he know? So just one of the biggest things early on I did though was put messaging out on social media. And that was for people to know what I do. And I mean, I had people reaching out from high school. They were like, I didn't know you were a loan officer. Well, I'd been a loan officer since 2009 and they never knew that. So like shame on me for yes. not making that known. The bank, it's a little different about what you can, you know, put out. You had handcuffs. Yes. So, yeah. you know, getting my messaging out there on social media was a great early on start. Then the agents that I was asking for warm introductions to, I would start following them. I would start liking their posts. I would start sharing their listings. And I would hope that they're seeing me too, right? Seeing who I'm working with, seeing what events I'm going to, seeing that they could trust me, that I'm you know, knowledgeable, that I'm an expert in my craft, right? So hoping that they see me from afar and have it be more of a slow play that when I actually do finally ask for the meeting, whether that's a month or three down the road, it should be an easy yes for the other side. Did you have a certain or do you have a certain cadence that you follow when it comes to your social media? No, I think just being consistent and having a variety of messaging. Like I don't I don't have oh. a, a, like any script, right? Do you post daily? Yes. Okay. I would say yes. I mean, um, there's. And I'm imagining you're posting on your personal pages. Correct. And I'm imagining that it's not all real estate and mortgage. That is exactly, I was actually going to bring that up. So I think the blend of personal has helped me tremendously. Um, and in our market, and I don't know how this is in other markets, but there is a total lack of social media presence for loan officers. So it is, there is a huge opportunity. There are not very many of my peers that are doing it and doing it well. And there are times that I'm like, I don't even know if anything I'm putting out is relevant, but you know what? I'm doing it. It is so baffling. So I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, Zach Tarbet. So Zach's a younger originator. Yeah. I coached him four years ago. He was um, exiting the military okay. and transitioning to his first civilian job, which was a mortgage loan originator. And at the awesome. time I took six Zacks that were all transitioning. Okay. And I coached them for an entire semester for free. Wow. Amazing. It was my way of giving back. Yes. Love right? that. Our military gives so much to us. Yep. It was my, my way of giving back. And it's so cool because I just saw Zach post in um, this private Facebook group called the Mortgage Mafia. Yeah. And he was like, y'all, for years, I've been told the power of social selling, the power of online networking. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you, I went from funding 30 units a year to 65 units already this year mm -hmm. because I did one thing and one thing mm -hmm. only. He started posting daily, creating yep. content. And nothing extreme. He's yeah. not trying to be the next the next TikTok superstar. Sure. But he's doing, doing it. Doing it. And then I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm like, okay. So literally within three years, less than three years, in two years, you have be you've made the Scotsman guide. Okay. For doing what? Your job. Networking. Mm -hmm. For reaching out to your circle and asking them to make warm introductions to people who sell real estate for a living. For making sure that you never eat alone. 
right? Like what a novel concept. Hey, just don't eat alone yeah. and see what that can bring you in terms of networking. And you are active online, which to me, I call that online networking. I call it that because I hate social media. Yeah. I hate the media. Or business media. I've yes, heard it called. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know? But it's, it's social selling. It's yes. online networking. I can do this. And this is a formula that I crafted because I think it's this easy. And it's 30, 10, 5, 5, 3, 1. Okay. So anyone who's tuning in or yeah. if, you're, if you're driving right now, pull over and write this down. So 30 minutes a day. Okay. You need to be online intentionally networking, not yep. boohooing because Ohio State just lost to Oregon. Or just like aimlessly scrolling. Yeah, yeah. or aimlessly scrolling. No, yep. you're 30 minutes, 15 in the morning, 15 in the, in yep. the evening. And then 10 times a day, you need to like, heart, or or uh, emoji someone else's post. Yep. That's just a little bit of engagement. Yes. Five times a day, you need to befriend somebody. So on LinkedIn, it's a connection. On yep. Instagram, it's a follow. Just five. Yep. Like expand your network. Love that. Five times, this is the second five, actually comment. Yeah. Because if this was traditional networking, me doing a, a heart or, an, or a like or an emoji is me making eye contact and smiling. Yeah, you want to engage. Yeah, but me commenting yes. is me actually you know, engaging in small talk. Yes. So five times, I want my my students yep. to actually go and comment now three times slide into somebody's dms yep it doesn't have to be about business like literally you just saw martha ran her first 10k yeah if you two are a runner slide in and say something nice and and congratulatory about the first 10k yes um and then one time one time a day just post yep and when you're posting follow this cadence three personal to one business and your one business cannot be a like buy here, pay here solicitation, like as if you're a used car salesperson. Sure. It's like, no, you are telling a story about your heart being filled because you just helped a young couple buy their first house. Yes. You know, but yes. if you just do that consistently, you'd be amazed be six, relatable. nine, 12 months down the road. And don't take my words. Yeah. Take Lauren's actions. Like yes. look at her production. Yeah. It's like find a way to be relatable to these people, right? Like how can they relate? To you and if they can already know you and like you and trust you then that's the that's the recipe right that's how you get the meetings and it's how you get the business and it's not difficult like you're looking at people that are in the same season of life as you too right kids in sports kids that are around the same age right working moms or working dads and it's like I like to travel I like to golf I, I do this I do that right and then you have things to talk about when you actually meet with them and it doesn't have to all be business right like yes. I want to get to know people and, and uncover the layers and build rapport and build trust and it's like you do that by just building a friendship and and then the business comes you know it doesn't have to all be you know what can you do for me what can I do for you type you know that that will come there's a lot of times I have my very first meeting with someone in person we don't even talk about business and that was something that Eric told me early on like listen more than you talk and and don't make it about business get to know them I love They're going to work with you if they like you, and they trust you more so than to know that you have the best products in town. I love that. Like re almost, re can you repeat that for us? You go to meetings and what happens? We, there were times we wouldn't even talk about yeah. business. Like I don't want them to be like, all right, cut to the chase. Like, why are you here? I'm here to get to know you. I'm here to figure out like, can we, can we be friends? Yeah. Right? Like what we talked about today, right? Can we be friends? Like it doesn't have to just be, what can you do for me? And what can I do for you? I want to get to know you and uncover some layers. I want to see if there's like some depth to this friendship that we could cultivate and then the business will come, right? With anything, I ask for referrals for every single thing that I do. I don't want anyone walking in my house unless someone refer them to me because th that there's so much more meaning to that. So that also goes into every time I do a loan, I do a great job on both sides of the transaction. That means I'm not only trying to wow the buyer's agent, who is hopefully already a, a referral partner of mine, but also a great opportunity for the listing agent. I have a great opportunity to give the client the best mortgage experience they've ever had so they can come back and so they can refer their families and friends. They can leave me a good review, right? Like there's so many components to one transaction. You have a title company, an insurance company involved that you can also really wow during that transaction, right? There's so many pieces and people. Like when I worked at the bank, I wouldn't even reach out to the listing agent. I don't know why. Like why, why was I not using that as an opportunity? Instead of me telling you I do a good job if I'm asking for a meeting or a cold call from you, here's an opportunity where I'm gonna show you that I'm doing a good job on this transaction. Was that taught to you or is that something you figured out on your own? 
a little bit of both. Like yeah. Eric had told us that early on, like you should always be working both sides. You should always be working both sides. Like something he kind of honed in on our team. But then I started to realize like there were times that I really wasn't even proactively trying to talk to the listing agent as much as I should have been. And they would reach out and say, this was a great transaction. You did a great job. Or during the transaction, they would say, thanks so much for the update. And it's like, this is a perfect opportunity for me to show you what a transaction with me looks like. So then at the end of this, I should easily be able to get a meeting with you. Yeah. And it really is that easy if you care. If you like, care. I think it, I think it starts like getting, getting into this interview as deep as we are right now. And like you come across a hundred percent, a genuine, right. But B, you love what you do mm -hmm. and, and you just care. So because you care, you're looking for opportunities to serve more people because mm -hmm. you love what you do. You're looking for opportunities to do more of it. Um, and you're authentically yourself. And I think that works. That's maybe sometimes hard to teach, but I think that's a, 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 a double check that we all should, should do, especially with that man or woman that stares back at us in the mirror. It's like, Hey, am I doing what I love and I'm yeah. passionate about? Do I care about what I'm doing? Yes. Um, cause if you care and you're passionate, there's a good chance yeah. that you're going to have your type of energy. So last three questions. All right. Looking back over the past two and a half, three years, what did you get wrong backslash what did you underestimate mm -hmm. or what is it that came and smacked you at a left field that if you were giving the next Lauren Walton some form of advice, you'd be like, hey, girl, look out for this. I think one of the biggest things is, well, these are kind of a twofold, but not getting an LOA soon enough. So I, I think a lot of us in this world, we want to have the control, right? And we want to we want to be involved in all pieces of the process and we just want to be the one that is like the CEO of the transaction and not giving any of that up. But not having an LOA made me shark tooth. So one month I have great production and the next month it drops off because all I was doing was being in the weeds and focusing on the pipeline and, and not prospecting. What what prevented you from making that hire? Um, I think I just wanted to like learn all the pieces of the process as best as I could in this new role or seat, so to speak, that I didn't want to delegate anything early on because I thought that, you know, I need to know all the pieces of the process. I need to know how to order an appraisal. I need to know how to order insurance. I need to know how to, you know, give all the updates to the clients and agents. And I want to know how to do everything in Encompass. And so I think it was just making sure that I fully understood the process. And again, part of it was just the, the difficulty delegating to people that I didn't know and trust yet. What would you say is the appropriate amount of leads generated monthly or units funded monthly before you would say hire an LOA? Probably like not that many, like probably five to seven, maybe eight at the most. Leads or, or Oh, units. sorry, units funded. Units funded. Yes. Yeah, so what, once you're consistently generating yes. 30 leads a month, yes. you're consistently funding four to six transactions. Yes. And you're in growth mode. I think that's important. And in, yes. And yes. you're in growth yes. mode. It's at that point, bite the bullet, yep. take the plunge. And I've talked to so many other loan officers that are that are there, right? They're hitting about eight units a month and they don't have an LOA and they're stuck. They have they they have no more room to grow because what's gonna happen is their service is gonna plummet. Yeah. So that was I should have done it earlier. I should have done it sooner. And then even once I got my LOA, it was getting comfortable with what can I delegate. Now I delegate as much as I can. And it was the best thing that I ever did for my business. And I hope eventually, my goal in 2025 is to grow a team. That's my goal for 2020. I finally feel like I have my arms around. That's my next question. This enough. <laughs> but the point of that is, is that I can then be out doing more of what I love, which is I like the business development side. I like the relationship side. And to be honest, like that's all I want to do. And so if I could get bodies in place to be able to help me service the incoming clients and the incoming agents, then I can continue to do more of what I love and what I'm good at. Yeah, no, um, a, a comment I wanted to make, and the reason why I asked you to dive deeper on the LOA yeah. is because there's nothing that will irk me more. You'll see me get fiery. I'll get on a soapbox. Some yep. people will use the term pissy. Yep. When I hear underperforming salespeople say, well, of course she can do that. She has a team or of course he's doing that. He has an assistant. And I'm like, no, no, they were doing, they were doing, yeah, before they, they, they wanted couldn't. it. They had mm -hmm. the drive. They had the passion. They were obsessed before they hired that team. So they didn't burn out. They Correct. hired a yep. team so they could get better. They yes. could do more. 
but they yes. they wanted it for because, capacity. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people will come to me when they're only generating eight to twelve leads. I need an assistant. I'm like, no, you need to get better. Yeah, and it is frustrating because before you come to that, like you know, realization yeah. that you need that, you're like, what what could I do? Like, how can I do? How could I produce more? when I have no time, when I'm, when I'm fully at my max capacity. Right. And so obviously the light bulb goes off. Right. But like you have to pay your LOA, right. That that's a component mm -hmm. of it, but also you have to be okay delegating and it takes some time to be ready for that. And it, it's a long process too. It's not like the second day, the first, or the first day I got my LOA, all of a sudden I delegated all the responsibilities. There's a transitional period and there's a learning curve there. And so now I'm on the completely on the other side of that where now like there is full trust and you know, we understand there's full accountability and we're, things are great, right? So now I can potentially start adding bodies like juniors or, you know, other LOs or LOAs to help support so I can continue to grow. So you answered my next question, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask it in case you wanna add anything to it, which is what does the future look like yep. for Laurel? So definitely a team. So I feel like I've always wanted to manage people. That's always been a component of, of and mentor. Um, but at Chase, I didn't really have like a mentorship opportunity, so to speak. There was management opportunities, but it's a little different at the bank. Um, not necessarily like the most attractive role, um, but in this particular retail space, um, managing people is something that I'm really interested in and really passionate about. I feel like I have a lot that I could help them learn and a lot that I can assist with. I would love to get the people that are kind of at that point where they feel like they they can't go any further. So they're good and I could take them to great or they're great and I could take them to elite, you know? So just how could I improve and enhance what they're already doing? So I do, um, that's on the docket for 2025. So for you, a team, like to me, when I hear a team, I'm like, okay, cool. I want a dedicated processor. I want my LOA and I want a true loan partner. To me, a loan partner is someone who can make 80 to $120,000 a year they are my right hand. Like yep. they are really good at deal structuring. Yes. They're really good at cranking out pre-approvals, um, locking loans, disclosing loans, but maybe they don't love the sales the and marketing mm -hmm. aspect. Yep. And if I had that as an originator, I know that with that team, I could easily fund 15 to 18 units a month. Yep. But it sounds like for you, that may be part of your component. But are you also saying that you want to go find the next Lauren and bring her into the fold and give her the same opportunity that Nick and Eric gave you? Yes. Okay. So there's there's a, both of that. So LOA processor that I have right now, like, oh, I hope they'll never leave me. Let's yeah. just put it that way. <laughs> put um, those golden but, handcuffs on Yeah, that. yeah. But production partner, absolutely. Okay. Um, or if you want to call that kind of a junior, definitely looking for some of those, um, as well as somebody that I can really groom and help yeah. them get to the next level. I think that would be very rewarding. Yeah, it's like an $8 million producer who's like, wait a minute, if she can do 40, I can do 40. Yep. If she can do 40, I can do 41. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um. So, yo, if you are in yeah. and around the Columbus, Ohio <laughs> yes, area, I make sure looking. you find her on Instagram, LinkedIn, yes, and uh, please Facebook. Do. Um, and definitely hit her up. So my last question, I told you I had three. What drives you? What motivates you? This is, this is an interesting question because I get this a lot and it's like, I can't even describe it other than like, it's just in me, okay. right? Eric and I talk about this all the time. Like you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. No one has taught me to be motivated. No one has taught me to be driven. Obviously my family is a huge component of that, but even before I had kids and before I was married, I still had drive and I still had passion and I still had, you know, I was still motivated. Um, I'm the baby of the family. I think that has something to do with it. I have two older brothers and there's just like that, you know, that need to always want to prove yourself and, yeah. and want to be something and, and not, you know, be shown up by anyone anyone else so so growing up uh, middle school high school age you're playing sports I know a lot of basketball were you always the coach's favorite my dad coached a little bit so I would hope so well. for some of that right <laughs> um yes I would say so um I feel like I've no, always no one had to ask you to put in the work correct yep. I would say no that is had absolutely had true serious and I've always tried to be um a leader you know my parents say that all the time and again my brothers are sick quite a bit older than me so you know I was almost like an only child for a period of my life but they're like you were always the ringleader and you were always the one that would like get everyone together and and I'm still that way right like I, I'm more of the type a the planner and and really try to bring people together and include everybody and just always try to be you know a good example and be a leader but the drive like it just I don't I'm competitive I don't like I, I want to do the best for my own self and I don't really care what other people are doing it's not that I'm trying to be the best against my peers necessarily but like be the best 
version of myself, right? Yeah. And so I think I surprise myself sometimes with like where I'm, where I've gone already and where I plan to go, but it's just continuing to put one foot in front of the other. And that's really just focusing on my attitude and my effort and not getting distracted by like the noise in the background. And the two things we all can control, our yeah. attitude and our, our effort. effort. And I'm assuming you are also a top producer at Chase. Yes. And I mentioned that because when someone asked me, hey, Dio, would you be willing to hire a rookie? I'm like, yeah, all day, every day. I've brought 36 plus rookies into this industry. Yes. But I will tell you this, I will not hire someone who is newly licensed, doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't have a book of business if they can't prove to me that they haven't once been recognized mm -hmm. in a prior life for being the best at something. Yeah. You know, it could have been, I was the team captain my junior year yeah. at Auburn University on the tennis team. Yes. Cool. You yes. were recognized, recognized by your peers at being great at yes. something, yes. great at leadership, yep. and you're a D1 competitor, yep. right? Like that may have been enough. It may have been, I was the number one sales rep at my AT&T store yeah. amongst 12 other reps. Yes. Like I just want there's to see something that about there's, that. yeah, there's this yeah. drive for excellence yes. that that transpires. And um, I, yeah. And I think that like being at the bank, it set the foundation for me. Like I was, I learned discipline there. I learned structure. I learned time blocking. Like I learned such great skill sets, but just what, what I knew could take me to the next level was the relationship component of the retail business. And that has proven itself to be true. That is awesome. I can see JC giving us the stink eye. You know what that means? That we're, <laughs> we're coming up um, on uh, on a hard stop on our time. I so enjoyed this. Like, this was awesome. thank you so much. I'm sure this episode is going to bang. Y'all, make sure that you have subscribed to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you like episodes like this, make sure you share it. Go over to Spotify, go over to Apple Podcasts, give us a five star review. And then, Lauren, if people do want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, Instagram, I would say my handle's Lending with Lauren. Um, the link to my website's on there where you can text me, call me, DM me. I'm an open book. So I always encourage clients, um, potential home buyers, obviously. Um, but, you know, fellow loan officers, agents, like ask me questions. That's what I'm here for. I want to be a resource and I want to, I want to add value anywhere I can. Awesome. Well, recorded on location at the lower headquarters in Columbus, Ohio. Can we she do is it? Lauren Walton. I'm Dustin Owen. You have just tuned in to an episode of the Loan Officer Podcast. That is all the time we have for you today, but we do look forward to catching you on the next episode. How about a little OH? No, thank you. <laughs>